I see Larry Deck has joined us, welcome. All right, according to my clock, it is noon. So I say we get started because I imagine many people are on their lunch break um, and probably wanna get to questions and answers. Oh, I see Cynthia has joined us. So I'm gonna promote you to panelists, Cynthia. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just quickly go over some of these introductory slides that just give you a sense of the meeting, um, how the meeting is structured and things that you need to know about the technology. Though I imagine most people are familiar with Zoom at this point in the game, um, but um, you may have noticed we are in a webinar format, which means your video and speaking and screen sharing abilities are not there and neither is a chat feature. Um, and that is because we've experienced some Zoom bombing and so we want to avoid that. And I know it feels a little bit stifling when we all can't see each other, um, but this is the way we're going to go because of the Zoom bombing incidents that we want to avoid. Um, you can leave and rejoin the meeting at any time unless you're kicked out for inappropriate behavior, and I hope it doesn't come to that. Um, you can communicate through the Q&A feature, and I see that Kevin, you already found that there, but that's, that's a way that you can send us a message, or if you do have a question, you can write it through there. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand, and I'll cover that in a second. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers um, following this presentation. And then all the materials are gonna be posted at this website that you see there, a2gov.org forward slash rescue funds. So we'll, play, we'll post this uh, video actually, we have the meeting from last night, if it's not already posted up there, that will be posted up there probably by the end of today, um, as well as any other materials and background information about the funding. All right, so presentation, move forward. Okay, here we go. So question and answers, again, you can use the raise your hand feature, which is at the bottom and we can allow you to speak. Um, and then there's the Q&A where you can submit questions through. If you are on the phone, I don't think we actually have anybody on the phone, but I know that in my experience, so sometimes I get booted off and need to rejoin by phone. So if that happens to you, uh, please do call in and you can raise your hand using star nine. And I do see that Council Member Griswold joined us. Welcome, Council Member Griswold. All right, and then we do have a demographic poll. This demographic poll is something that we'd like to do to get a sense of who's joining us at our meetings. Um, so we can get a sense of who's not joining us um, because we do want to get a broad perspective from our community. So if you don't mind taking this poll, it is completely optional and it is anonymous. Um, we do ask you, to take a moment to take this. Um, so we can just add that to our collection of data that we're getting from all of our meetings. So again, so we can have an understanding of who we're reaching and who we're not. So I'm gonna launch that right now. And we'll just pause for a moment. And I do see that we have somebody that joined us by phone. You can uh, press star nine if you have questions where you can virtually raise your hand and we'll call on you and allow you to speak. Again, we'll give another moment for people to take the demographic poll. All All right, I see people are taking it. I'm going to forge ahead just a, a moment um, while people are taking this poll um, and talk about our meeting norms. Um, uh, this is basically um, our ask to have people be nice to each other during our meetings. We ask that you commit to learning and avoid speculation. Um, we also ask that if you're speaking over the phone or even um, if you're joining us by computer, if you could move to a quiet place. I know that's not always easy. Sometimes we have chaos going around us, but that does help things move a little bit smoother. And we do really want to hear what you're saying. So if it's possible, please do move to a quiet place. Um, we also ask that you remember the importance of rights and dignities at, of others. So with that, we ask that you critique ideas, not people, and that you are thoughtful about your language. We want this to be a comfortable space for everybody to join. All right, one more moment on the poll.
All right, I'm gonna close out the poll. Thank you for all of us who took it. We really appreciate it. Okay, moving on. All right, so this gets us into the content of what we want to cover. And just very briefly, um, we wanted to talk about what is the ARPA fund. And there is going to, our assistant city manager or city administrator talked a little bit more deeply about this last night. So if you have a chance to watch the video from last night's meeting, um, he'll give a, a deeper overview than I'm, I'm about to give. But just very briefly, um, the American Rescue Funds are really in response to COVID and everything that occurred. Um, during that time with shutting down businesses and, um, and everything that we all know that we've experienced. So this is the federal response to that. Um, that's basically a government bailout for the pandemic impacts. We're receiving 24.2 million um, and that's modeled on the CDBG grant funding model, if, if all of you are familiar with that. If not, um, there are some resources out there online that gives more information about that. Um, as well as ARPA funding in general. And federal regulations, um, this is something that we just wanna hit home. There, there are a lot of conditions to this funding. And so federal regulations stipulate how the funds can be spent. And these are basically the four buckets. And we do have Marty Prashan on the line here, who is our finance director. And so she can, if you have question, more questions about this later on, she can go into a little bit more detail about it. But these are basically our four buckets of, um, where the money can be spent. So the negative economic impacts of COVID, of COVID um, premium pay for eligible workers, um, loss of revenue and infrastructure investments and water, sewer and broadband infrastructure. Oops. Um, so this is how, um, I'm sorry, my screen is messing up just for a moment. Uh, a little bit of glitch here. Uh, so here is a little bit more background information. Um, so some prohibitive uses are pension contributions, debt payments may not be used for a federal match. Um, there's significant reporting requirements um, and ARPA funds are temporary in nature. So um, care should be avoided to set up programs that are gonna be an ongoing basis. Um, and then everything needs to be spent by 2026. So again, just hitting home the point that these funds are very particular, they're kind of finicky. So they, they need to be spent uh, in a particular way. And so that's why the projects emerged as they did. That gives you a, at least a little bit of background about why the projects were chosen the way they were chosen. Um, additionally, I'll also add that the projects that were chosen are projects that have had process behind them um, behind them, they are, many of them are in our plans that exist right now, which had um, public process behind it to help choose uh, the projects that came forward. All right. And again, this is a little bit more background on how the projects were identified. Um, we had to adhere to the federal guidelines, uh, reviewed prior council direction, and identified projects that could be spent down before the 2026 deadline. All right, so that brings us to the topic at hand. So I'm gonna turn this over to Raymond, who's gonna give a brief introduction of the two projects that we're talking about today. And then we'll jump into some questions and answers. Very good, thank you, Heather. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raymond Hess. I'm the transportation manager for the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, I am joined by two of my colleagues. Mr. Eli Cooper is the transportation program manager and he helps with a lot of our transportation planning initiatives. And I also have Cynthia Redinger, uh, our transportation engineer who handles a lot of the technical engineering aspects for transportation projects as well. Uh, so I may um, need them for a lifeline uh, from time to time to answer some of your questions if need be. Uh, so we're going to be reviewing two different projects during this session. Uh, the first is the Vision Zero implementation. Um, so as the, the slide mentions, um, City Council recently adopted a master transportation plan, which we call Moving Together Towards Vision Zero. Um, that was adopted in July of 2021, so it's pretty fresh off the presses. It's only uh, six months old. It was very data driven uh, and it was also uh, very much driven by public input uh, that we received. It was about a two year process to develop that plan. We had thousands of touch points with the public. 
We looked at thousands of data points and all of that kind of blended together into this plan. And the plan is very much focused on safety. Uh, and as you can see on the slide, Vision Zero is defined as uh, eliminating all fatal and serious injuries uh, that occur on our roadways. Um, and so this is serious crashes involving pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, scooter users, you know, any, anybody. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, um, you know, we have a guide line, we have a strategy, we have a book now that can really help us identify how we can get to Vision Zero. And that plan uh, is very ambitious, but it, it has a very uh, succinct strategy in terms of how to get there. Uh, and in, you know, high level talking terms, uh, you know, we're really looking at reducing speed, enhancing system design, providing education, providing transportation options to people, um, and then looking at what we call kind of the six E's, right? So engineering, education, enforcement, equity, evaluation, and encouragement. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a balanced approach in terms of how we get to Vision Zero. Um, this project is estimated at $9.5 million. Um, I will put a footnote on that in that this project is scalable. Uh, I say that to mean that, you know, if council decides to put more money on this project or less money on this project, uh, it is something that, you know, can be adjusted accordingly. That this is really kind of a menu of projects. It's not just one big corridor project that's going to be rebuilt. It's a bunch of little projects that we hope can make a significant impact throughout the community. The other thing I want to highlight on that space, too, is um, the plan really talks about quick build deployments, that we need not wait for the reconstruction of a roadway to make improvements to safety on that roadway. Uh, there are tools in our toolbox now, whether it's just repainting the roadway and the stripes on the roadway, whether it's putting in um, plastic delineators and other sort of materials that uh, can be put in relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. Uh, and the plan really talks about the importance of pursuing um, those interim type measures so that we don't have to wait years and years for a road to be touched before we make improvements to that project. Um, the last thing I'll note here is if you're interested in the plan or Vision Zero just in general, uh, there's a wealth of information on the project website, which is the city's website, uh, which is a2gov.org slash Vision Zero, uh, and that will take you right to the plan. That will take you to all the support documentation for the plan. There's a very interesting fact book that was developed in the plan development process that gives you kind of a snapshot of what transportation looks like in Ann Arbor, uh, and it talks about a lot of the data that went in to identify, you know, the areas of concern and what needs to be done to address those areas of concern. All right, Heather, maybe skip over to Miller Catherine, yeah. and we'll talk about that. All right, and then the second project that we're uh, entertaining questions from the community today on is the Miller Catherine bike facility. So the transportation plan uh, acknowledges a need for high comfort, low stress bicycle facilities, or what we also call all ages and all abilities bike facility. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, um, cyclists come in different shapes and forms and experience levels. And so, um, you know, one type of bike facility, especially like a bike lane or a share the road type facility, uh, may not attract the same number of users as people who have less confidence in riding. Um, or, you know, in my case, I have a little daughter. There are certain facilities I would feel comfortable biking with her on, and there are other facilities that would be less so. So the idea behind the Miller Catherine bike facilities is to create one of these high comfort, all ages and abilities bike facility that pretty much runs the length of Miller Catherine. So to the western limits, we're talking about the park and ride lot just past the uh, I-94 interchange, um, coming all the way into downtown and connecting to University of Michigan. Um, now, I will note this question was raised last night. Uh, for those of you familiar with Miller Catherine, the Downtown Development Authority is planning a project on uh, Miller Catherine to put in such a high comfort bike facility uh, between Division and First. Uh, this project would build off of that. We are coordinating pretty closely with the DDA on that, uh, and it would just pretty much extend the limits of the DDA's project uh, further to the east and further to the west. Um, now, I will note that the DDA's project is specifically targeting a 
protected cycle track. Um, the cycle tracks are what you may have seen downtown that are relatively new. There's one on William, one on First, one that just opened up on Division, and then the new one will be on Miller Catherine that will get installed next year, or I'm sorry, this year, now that it's 2022. Um, we don't know yet if a cycle track uh, can work the entire length of the project, um, but there is dedication on this to have it be a high comfort facility. So a cycle track fits into that, but it could also be a bike lane, kind of like you see on the screen here. This is what we would call a buffered bike lane, which is just paint that separates the bicycles from the motor vehicles. We would actually be looking at a protected facility, which would have some sort of vertical separation. So some sort of, you know, element that sticks up, whether that be, you know, concrete, or whether that be flexible delineators, something to that effect um, would be considered, uh, you know, another option on Miller Catherine. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the project, as we've kind of envisioned it, also includes some traffic calming elements. Um, now, if you're not familiar, Miller is classified as an arterial in the city, and we currently don't have a major streets traffic calming program. So the things that we typically would do in a neighborhood street, like speed humps and things like that, um, may not be applicable. Maybe they are, but they may not be applicable on a major arterial. But we have heard, um, it, you know, concern over the years from uh, people who traverse Miller and who live along Miller about the speeds along Miller. And so we would look at design elements as part of the project to also reduce vehicle speeds. Um, you know, Miller, it's a long straight shot with very little traffic control. And so what happens is cars kind of pick up speed as they, maybe they're coming off Maple, maybe they're coming all the way off, you know, um, the park and ride lot and, and you know, the, the, it's a clean straight shot. So we're looking at ways to, to slow down vehicles as they use Miller. The estimated cost for this project is at $4 million. Um, using estimates on recently completed bicycle facilities, we anticipate the bicycle facility portion to cost about $2.5 million, and that the traffic calming elements would cost about $1.5 million. Um, this project is probably a little less scalable than the last project, uh, in part because we would wanna make sure that the Miller Catherine bike facility ties into some existing bike facility. And so when you get from the boundaries of the DDA's project at First Street, pretty much it's a long shot all the way to uh, Maple before you hit another bike facility. Now, there are some on 7th and things like that, but, um, you know, the, the break points are, are, you know, pretty few and far between if we're trying to make uh, logical connections. Um, so, you know, this project is, with many others, is somewhat scalable, but probably less so than the other. So I did want to mention that as well. So I think that's really all we wanted to do for right now is just give an overview of the projects at a very high level. Um, if you haven't seen the videos, there are videos available on the website that go in, they're only about two minutes long, so they're an easy watch. Um, you know, there are you know, about a dozen or more projects that are being proposed for the use of ARPA funds. Um, you can watch all the videos or you can just single in on the ones that you're interested in. Um, and it gives some you know, additional visual representation of what those projects might entail. Okay, great. So let's just jump into questions and answers. Um, oh, and I see John has joined us. Welcome, John. All right, we do have a hand that's raised. Um, so Patricia, I think is your name. Um, please go ahead and, and talk. Can you tell us how long you expect the construction to take? Yeah, good question, Patricia. Thank you for that question. Um, so now, I think there are, you know, there are two different projects that are being proposed. One, let me start with the Miller Catherine project. Um, yeah, well, that's actually, the me... one. I, I live on Brooks off Miller, oh. and I know what went on on Liberty all those for years and years of construction. Yeah, no, it's a great question. My understanding, uh, and hopefully Marty or John can correct me if I'm wrong, is based on the federal guidelines, uh, this money has to be drawn down by 2026. So uh, my understanding is, you know, the project will not last years and years and decades and decades. It has to have a hard stop by uh, 2026. And furthermore, the project has to be programmed kind of in federal processes, transportation improvement programs or whatever is appropriate, uh, I believe by 2024, if I'm not mistaken. So um, that's all to say that, you know, there, there is a hard stop in terms of when the projects would have to be done by. 
Now, in terms of an exact construction timeline, I don't necessarily have that developed yet because we don't yet know if this project will be uh, chosen for funding. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, the idea with all of these projects is, is that they are semi shovel ready. So even though we don't have, um, you know, design done on it per se, that we know the limits of the corridor, we understand what the right of way constraints are. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, a lot of this might be quick build in nature. So some of it may require some, you know, pouring cements and things like that. But a lot of it might also just be, you know, plastic delineators or things that can be placed relatively quickly in the roadway. Um, in looking at, you know, the pace at which the downtown development authority has been able to implement the projects they've done downtown. Uh, they were able to do most of those in a single construction season with some modifications that are made after the fact. Um, you know, for example, they just finished the division cycle track. So I would hope that we would have a similar type of timeline that we would get the bulk of the work done in a single construction season and that, you know, any other uh, additions or tweaks that need to be made could be made, you know, subsequently uh, as warranted. Where do you expect the traffic to go while you're working on Miller? Yeah, again, I mean, that would be part of the design process. We would develop a maintenance of traffic plan. Um, I, it's not clear to me yet whether we would require road closures or if we, you know, that would require detours and things of that nature, um, or if, you know, some of those lanes could be remain open. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in certain circumstances, um, maybe one lane would have to be closed in order to, you know, allow for construction to occur and still allow for one direction of travel, um, you know, whether that's eastbound or westbound. But uh, admittedly, I don't have a great answer for you yet on that because, you know, again, that would be kind of sorted out as part of the design process. Thanks, um, that's, for what plenty. It, that's plenty. Yeah, I understand. Good. Yeah, and, and Patricia, since you live in that area, I'm sure you experienced some of the pain uh, when um, Maple uh, was shut down because of that water main break and there was a lot of cut through traffic. Uh, yep. that was happening on a lot of those residential cross streets. Uh, I think we learned a lesson from that and we would try to be very sensitive to those neighborhood streets and make sure that we try to minimize the amount of cut through traffic to the extent possible. Um, you know, that was an unexpected thing that occurred and we had to kind of do a lot to help, you know, the neighborhood mitigate some of that adverse uh, impact that occurred. So we are, we are mindful of it and we'll try to mitigate it to the extent possible. All right, and we have another person with their hand raised, so I'm going to allow you to speak, and then we'll jump over to some Q and A. Hello, um, I have questions. I have lots of questions, but I will only ask one right now. Um, for the Miller Catherine High Comfort Bike Fit High Comfort, I think you said uh, bike mm -hmm. facility. So the DDA Miller Catherine bikeway is going to be a bikeway, I think. And it's going to be just like, I don't know if it's going to be similar to the first bikeway, which is elevated or the division bikeway or Washington William bikeways, which are not elevated. Um, but those bikeways are designed in a way that they don't like, they don't, you, you can plow them with like little truck, right? So you don't have to, uh, um, taking anything out in the winter when it snows or in the fall when you have uh leaves everywhere in an arbor we have a ton of leaves and rain when leaves and rain mix it just ends up getting in the gutters and uh it makes some of our current bike lanes basically unusable um especially in the way they're designed on roads that haven't been uh like given buffered bike buffered bike lanes or really updated at all. I mean, Miller currently is in that state. So what, what design elements are you guys pursuing to avoid having things like, uh, like a bikeway that might be taken away for the snow or right. um, making sure that like snow clearance and leaf clearance can occur without, um, like without impacting the high comfort level because if, if it is low protection, like I know Cleveland has this bike bike lane. Um, sorry, Columbus has this bike lane, which kind of sucks because they designed it in a way that they want to like plow the snow out of it. Um, and it just ends up not being a safe, like it's not high comfort at all, but they call it high comfort. 
Um, and I just want to ask what what elements here is looking to pursue in that kind of aspect to avoid making it suck? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. Um, you know, it's it's interesting as the um, kind of thinking and the the just profession advances in the development of bike facilities. You've honed in on some of the issues with the facilities that we look at to do now. So um, I, I will say that whatever we decide to pursue, we will work very closely with public works to make sure that they do have the ability to clear snow out as well as leaf and debris out of those bike lanes. Um, one of the benefits, as you've kind of alluded to with the facilities that the, down, the DDA is doing downtown, is it does allow for a small vehicle to both do snow clearance as well as street sweep along those bike facilities. Because when you put the two bike lanes kind of together with that buffer, uh, it allows for them to maintain that. Um, one of the challenges I will admit with you that um, if we decide to do the bike lanes on the sides of the road, one in each direction with some sort of vertical element, that bike lane is narrower and then poses a different maintenance challenge to public works. So it is definitely something we need to be very mindful of that if we do propose, you know, the ladder that I just described, that we have some solutions set in mind for public works so that they can maintain that facility. Um, you know, the other thing, though, I will admit to you that, you know, there are several pinch points along the corridor that we'll have to be very careful about how we design. Uh, probably the first one that will come across just um, to the west of First Street is the railroad viaduct. Um, there are the support structures for the railroad track there, uh, and the road gets very narrow. So we'd have to be very thoughtful about how we can accommodate the bike facility there. Um, the other thing to note is there are sections of Miller that have dedicated on-street parking. So we would want to work with the adjacent neighborhood about where that parking is, who it serves, you know, does it, should it stay there, should it move, or should it be removed? All of those things would have to be taken into consideration. Uh, and then the other thing, too, quite frankly, that we have to keep in mind is, you know, just the number of driveways along Miller. There are, you know, a lot of homes uh, and single family residences and, and businesses and such front Miller with their driveways. So we need to make sure that whatever we do um, both maintains that access but at the same time provides this high comfort, high safe facility along Miller Catherine that can be maintained in the way that you identified uh, and you know, serve as many of the functions as we wanna serve. So uh, you bring up a great point. It is something very top of mind. It's something that we're working uh, as closely with public works on as we possibly can. Thank you. I'll let, I'll let other people go, thank you. Thank you. We do have some, um written questions coming in. So I'd like to jump to those and then I'll get back to um, people who have their hands raised. The first one is about um, the process and what comes after this um, and how will there be feedback forms and surveys. So I'm gonna actually answer that a little bit later. I have a slide on that. So I'll, I'll be sure to answer that before the meeting ends. But um, so I'm gonna jump to some other questions that are about the project specifically. And the first one is, do you have a sense of what the project cost estimate would be if it only extended to say seventh? Uh, you're muted, Raymond. Sorry, I hear you. Uh, yeah, Kevin, that's a good question. I don't have that number uh, readily available to me, uh, but it is something we can, can do. We, the way we came up with the project cost was just a per linear foot cost. Um, and you know, then just multiplied it out by the length of the project. So we, you know, we can come up with that cost to seventh to Maple to any other point along the corridor, um, and that might be something we can follow up with you on, or or Heather, maybe you and I can chat afterwards about some of these issues that require follow up. How the best way is to communicate that information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. Um, Let's see, the next question is, can you comment on why the Miller-Catherine corridor was prioritized? Was there thought given to increasing the current comfort level width of Liberty Painted Lane? Are roundabouts being considered for car calming, or traffic calming? Yeah, the, that great series of questions there. So Miller-Catherine was identified first and foremost because it is identified in the transportation plan um, for two reasons. It's first identified as a, um, 
a safety corridor, a corridor that's in need of getting safety improvements. So again, it's, I started off by saying this is Vision Zero Focus. We want to make sure that we're addressing the safety concerns along that corridor. Um, additionally, it's also identified in the transportation master plan as a high comfort, all ages and abilities bike facility. So those two things kind of made it bubble to the top. Um, the other reason why it was chosen is we have uh, for years now um, heard concerns from the community about Miller. Now, admittedly, we hear similar concerns about Liberty. We hear similar concerns about Dexter. Um, but Miller in particular, I think, has a, a longer standing set of concerns because some of the schools that are located along Miller, some of the parks, some of the other things that are located. Um, and it just you know, it, it, it's a pretty long corridor, right? And it, it ties um, pretty much the whole length of, of the community. So um, we, we thought that, you know, this project would um, hopefully enjoy a fair amount of public support. And the fact that it was, you know, identified in the transportation plan on kind of two of our important maps, uh, we thought that, you know, that really made sense to, to target Miller first. Um, and what I will say, though, is if if Miller proves to be a success and we are able to kind of, you know, crack the code in terms of how to, you know, bring crashes down and, and address the safety concerns and provide people with transportation options, it might be a process that we can replicate on a roadway such as Liberty. Now, every street has its own constraints and we would have to take those into consideration, but it is something, you know, when we're looking at a corridor this long, um, we want to make sure that we can come up with a solution that, you know, is somewhat scalable and can be applied to other places. Um, and then the other, let's see. Oh, and then roundabouts. Um, yeah, so there has long been discussion of a roundabout, especially at the intersection of uh, Nixon and Miller. Um, now, there are some right of way constraints at that location. Uh, so I, I'm not going to promise you that a roundabout is part of the project, but it is something we might look at. Um, now, there are different tools in our toolkit in terms of how we can address, um, you know, slowing down traffic. A roundabout would be considered for that purpose to help slow down traffic and improve kind of the intersection, um, you know, at that location. There are compact mini roundabouts, but that may not be the, the best approach here. If we wanted to do a full-fledged roundabout, we might need right away, but right away sometimes takes time. And if, you know, there aren't willing sellers, then it, you know, it might complicate our ability to implement that as part of this project. Um, in terms of other traffic calming elements beyond roundabouts, uh, what I will say is we have a consultant under contract right now that's working on a couple things. One is a Vision Zero implementation strategy, which is taking the plan that was adopted in July and kind of digesting that into actionable items. Uh, and the good news is that work is already underway. Uh, now it just kicked off, so it's not very far along. But the good news is it's, it's really going to help set the foundational work for that Vision Zero project that I described earlier. Also included is a major streets traffic calming process. Now, if you're familiar with traffic calming in Ann Arbor right now, the processes and the petitions are specifically targeted at local neighborhood streets. Uh, however, we acknowledge the fact that there are concerns along our major streets, so our arterials and our collectors, and the consultant is going to help us develop a toolkit in terms of which approaches would be appropriate on these kind of higher volume, higher speed roadways uh, in terms of getting vehicles to, um, you know, get down to the speeds that are desirable and improve the safety along those corridors. So um, hopefully that process can also shed light on some of the design elements that could go into Miller, especially if, you know, if a roundabout is determined to be not feasible because of whatever reason, uh, there might be other things that we can pursue along that corridor. And Raymond, just a clarification, I think you said Nixon and you meant Newport. I'm, yes, thank you. That's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Newport. <laughs> yeah. Um, this next question, I think, might be best for Marty and John to answer. Um, and this question is, I'm piecing together that um, that the big portion of this conversation is, one, is this something we want to use the Recovery Act funds for? And two, how much of those funds do we want to spend on this? For question number two, is it possible to offer a selection of packages? Um, i.e. for this much money we could do X or for this much money we, we could do Y? 
Uh, I'd be happy to answer that, but uh, I'm being stopped from turning my video on by the host. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize <laughs> That's that. That's okay. Let me elevate your status there. Ooh. All right, you should be able to do that. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm happy to, to answer the question. And I think, um, first of all, I think that uh, that is right. What, uh, what we are asking from the public is, is this a project that um, the public feels should be included in the final matrix of, uh, of projects that are recommended to council, A, and B, is it uh, of such importance that uh, we should fund the entire thing or we should fund it partially or, or what? Um, and so that kind of feedback is really valuable for us. I do want to uh, resist kind of slicing the project up um, because there are a million ways we could cut a project like this up and other projects. Uh, and it, you know, uh, we would kind of get into a get into a, a position where we're just endlessly providing new configurations to the public. And so what we really want to keep the conversation kind of focused on, uh, a, include this in the in the matrix, and B, is it so important that we should fund the entire thing um, compared to the other priorities we have? And with that feedback, I think that staff can sit down and look at the type of feedback we uh, get on those two questions for a number of these projects, and then make a final recommendation to council that kind of balances everything that we're hearing from the community. So that's that's what we're asking of the public. Thank you, John. Hmm. All right, um, going back to some project-based questions, the Vision Zero implementation description references the possibility of conducting and implementing a citywide speed study. Is this, is this something that will be undertaken by regular city staff or will it be something that city searches for a consultant or contractor to conduct? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me just, um, give you a little bit of background on what we're thinking here. Um, it, and actually, I might even share a slide to help frame the issue um, because I think it helps explain what it is we're trying to achieve and why it's being suggested here. So All right. Um, Heather, is my PowerPoint showing properly I can here? See it. Yeah. Okay. So ultimately, I think this slide here is the one um, that we really want to focus on, um, which is, you know, the the speed at which vehicles are traveling when they, you know, um, if they encounter a crash with a pedestrian or any other vulnerable road user, such as a cyclist. Um, if, a, if a vehicle is doing 20 miles per hour, you know, the chance of survival is very good, right? It's, it's 9.5 9 out of 10. Whereas if a vehicle is doing 40 miles per hour, it's pretty much flipped on its head. Chance of survival is only one out of 10. And so the, the reason why we think speed is critical to really achieving vision zero is we wanna see what can we do to make sure that vehicles are traveling at appropriate speeds on our corridors. Uh, so that provides the justification of what it is we hope to achieve. Um, and so part of that then is looking at, when, when we talk about this speed study, the question is, you know, what are our current posted speed limits and speed limits and how they're posted you know there's some science that goes beyond that that cynthia can speak to um a, a lot of the methodology used to establish speed limits has been fairly uh questionable in the past well i won't say questionable it, I, i'll say the 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 science and the the thinking again has evolved whereby we're not just looking at how fast cars are currently traveling in order to determine what the speed limit is. There are other factors that we can take into consideration. Um, and so this speed study would help us look at that. Which roadways are posted at what speeds? Are those speeds appropriate? And then what are the things we can do to get those speeds down to an appropriate, uh, not just posted speed, but actual, you know, what's realized on the streets. Um, and so, so that's the genesis, that's the thinking behind all of that. Uh, in terms of whether it would be done by city staff or consultants, uh, I would anticipate that we would probably want some consultant assistance with this. Uh, again, we want this to be very data driven. We want this to be, you know, very sound in terms of the approach that we take. That's not to say that city can't do that. City staff can't do that. 
Um, but we also like to make sure that, you know, we are, you know, bouncing our ideas off of other professionals and following best practices. Um, so there's a good chance that this one would, in fact, um, be done in coordination with a consultant. Um, but again, you know, we haven't made that decision definitively, but I could see in this instance, this is something that would benefit from some consultant uh, assistance on. Um, Cynthia, do you want to maybe uh, supplement anything I said or correct anything I just said? Since, uh, you know, as the subject matter expert, you, you know a lot more on in terms of speed setting and some of the ideas that might go into that. Sure, I can add a couple of things. First of all, I'll say um, you didn't get anything wrong. But <laughs> yeah, it, the the state of the practice as far as, as speed setting has been uh, evolving very rapidly over the last several years. And a lot of that does come along with the focus on, on safety and getting better data and better understanding of the physics of crashes. And part of Vision Zero is acknowledging that you know, human error does occur, so crashes do occur, and what can we do to decrease those, those impacts? So as, as understanding that the physics of crashes is really important in, in determining those outcomes, uh, the the approach from the federal level down, a lot of research has been devoted to this area so that we have new guidance on how to be setting speed limits in a more appropriate manner for the context that we're in. All right, thank you both. Uh, there's a hand raised by Council Member Griswold, so I'm going to allow you to speak now. Okay, you should be able to go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And um, I do have one question. Given that the mix of vehicles is changing, I know that that diagram with the, the percent of, of vehicle or uh, pedestrians that are going to be injured based on speed uh, is based on sedans. And now that we have so many delivery trucks, pickup trucks, SUVs that have these high aggressive front ends, um, I'm wondering if there's any new research coming from the federal government that updates that. And if so, do we want to prioritize reducing conflict points um, and more use of technology. I hear regularly about how scary the crosswalks are on South Main where they're at intersections, but there isn't any signage. And I'm wondering if there are plans to use more technology, be it RRFBs or pedestrian activated signals. So thanks. Yes, thank you, Councilmember Griswold, for that question. Um, it's a good one. You're absolutely right. You know, a lot of the research is suggesting that, you know, speeds play a critical role in determining the severity and, and mortality outcome of a crash. But as you mentioned, a lot of larger vehicles now with, you know, higher, um, you know, grills, higher bumpers, you know, they hit people in kind of their core uh, and result in a more severe crash. Um, you know, I, I I won't confess that anything that we're proposing here is specifically targeted at, you know, one type of vehicle versus another type of vehicle. I think, you know, the idea is if we can manage speeds and get them down to a level where the chances of survival are greater, um, you know, I think that's ultimately what we're targeting. Uh, in terms of the vehicle mix, that's a very hard thing for us to kind of control at a local level, right? Uh, you know, people are going to buy the type of vehicle they're going to buy. And so it's, it's hard to, you know, change that. But if we can get everybody operated at a safe speed, uh, even acknowledging that even a, a higher clearance vehicle operating at the same speed as a sedan still might have a different outcome, it, it still can lead to safety if they're moving slower, right? So I think that's ultimately where my, my thought is on that. Um, and then, um, Let's see, in terms of your second question about technology, yes, the Vision Zero uh, implementation um, strategy project does include a whole host of projects, including uh, upgrading crosswalks to our crosswalk design guideline standards. 
um, many of which would include you know, installation of rectangular rapid flashing beacons. For those of you on the call not familiar with that, these are the yellow signs that have the embedded lights that when the pedestrian hits the button, it brings added awareness to motorists that a pedestrian will be crossing. Um, so yes, that's definitely part of it. The other thing we've talked about Raymond, you're on mute. I don't know how it happened, but. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, my apologies. My phone slipped and now my video went off. All right. So, um, yeah, the other thing I was going to say is that um, we've also had some preliminary exploratory discussions with the University of Michigan, in particular, the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute and M-City uh, to talk about, you know, are there any sort of analytics or like near miss uh, analytics that can be done. Uh, so what I mean by that is, um, you know, a lot of the crash patterns that we observe are based on crash reports filled out by law enforcement agencies. So this is a, you know, confirmed crash where a police officer showed up and filled out a report. However, we know that there are close calls that maybe never get reported. So we call these near misses. And so is there an opportunity for us to put up sensors or tap into existing uh, traffic cameras and things like that to help us identify the extent of the problem for near miss analytics. Um, and ultimately, here's how I would love for this to play out um, is, let's say, for example, the um, Vision Zero transportation plan identifies an intersection that is an area of concern. We could go out and establish some baseline data collection in partnership with the university and identify what's really happening there. What are the recorded crashes, but what are also those near misses that occur? That will help inform what the countermeasure is. In other words, you know, what is it we're going to do out there that's going to have the most impact? Um, and then the university, you know, if we, you know, if that partnership exists, then they can continue to um, analyze the project and its effectiveness after we put in whatever it is we put in. Uh, and so a lot of that is technology based, right? It could be cameras, it could be sensors, it could be any number of things. Uh, and we've already started some discussions, like I said, with Umtree and MCity about the possibility of doing that and they're interested in that partnership. Okay, I just wanna add, yes, Umtree has an excellent reputation and, and so that's great. Um, and my last concern, and maybe you're already considering this, is when you get hit by a vehicle with a higher profile, not only are you getting hit in your trunk, but the chance of being dragged underneath the tires of the vehicle are greater. So uh, we need to lower speed, but we also need to reduce those conflict points. And that sounds like what you're doing with this near miss analysis. So that's great news, thanks. All right, now I know we uh, may have lost our hostess with the mostess. So I will look at the uh, questions that are typed until she has a chance to rejoin us. Um, there is a question about what types of traffic calming techniques are being pictured on Miller. Uh, I touched on this a little bit. Um, maybe Cynthia, if you wanna supplement what I said earlier about you know roundabouts and things like that, um, maybe talk about curb extensions or some of the other things that we've deployed on some major roads that, you know, might be up for consideration here as well. Sure, I can, I can start with that. And um, as Raymond mentioned earlier, we do have um, an open contract that where the work is ongoing and we will be developing a a suite of sort of standard practices for speed management on, on these corridors. So um, when you think, when we think of, of traffic calming, I put that in quotes, on our, our, our more major corridors, we are thinking about those sorts of um, what they are speed, it's a speed management toolkit, right? So, but it will still be similar to our local streets program and that it will be comprised of devices that you drive over or around. 
So examples that, that Raymond already brought up are things such as bump outs and those, you know, road narrowings are particularly effective where we have crossings and we're able to um, minimize that crossing distance for pedestrians. So you get the benefit of slowing driver choice, speed choice, lowering that as well as um, limiting the exposure in the crosswalk for pedestrians. Other items that um, are, are pretty common practice are things such as pedestrian refuge islands or pedestrian islands, you know, an area in the middle of the road that provides protection and also gives that slowing. Uh, fifth in Carytown is an excellent example of um, kind of a, a non-traditional use of that sort of, of device. And um, also, you know, roundabouts are something that, that can be considered in locations if it fits the context and it works operationally. But some vertical devices or things that you drive over can also be considered and um, not completely taken out of of the toolbox, but they would be slightly different. So in our local streets traffic calming program, we use a lot of speed humps, which are shorter devices that are driven, driven over. And those can be difficult for vehicles that are larger, particularly our um, emergency responders and the fire department. So looking at those, those types of devices, you're looking at more of a longer vertical device. So it could be a speed table, which is kind of similar to a, um, to a speed hump, but it has a much longer along the street sort of dimension. And raised intersections are also something that could be looked at on a more major street. And in a lot of these locations, they're, they're slower speed facilities anyways, and there are locations where we want slower speed. So these types of devices would not be inappropriate. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. And, and thank you for that thorough answer because you answered another question, which was, you know, is there a possibility to implement raised crosswalks or raised intersections where there's relatively high pedestrian throughput and high average speeds? Really good question. I think Cynthia did a good job of touching on the considerations that some of those what we call vertical devices that you drive over, uh, we'd like those to be on the table, but because it's a major road, we have to be cognizant of, you know, who's using that road and, and how that facility is designed. So we're hopeful that, you know, that's on the table for consideration, um, but it might look and feel a little bit differently than the applications we put on the neighborhood local streets. All right, um, another question is, uh, it says the Vision Zero implementation description references reconfiguration of lanes on Packard and mentions the possibility of adding protected bike lanes. Uh, is Packard a possibility to receive protected bike lanes? Uh, and the follow-up thought is that I think Packard is under-discussed under because for a while uh, out of town, out of downtown lots of the occupants are students who are not engaged in the community engagement process. However, the relatively wide right of way, high potential usage and the high speeds along the corridor make it a good candidate, not to mention the fact that some of Ann Arbor's most tragic bike accidents happened on that road. Um, that it's a very good question. It's a very good observation. Packard is one of our highest used bike facilities. So I think the idea, but it's not considered a high comfort facility, right? It is just paint. It's a bike lane. It's a more traditional application. Um, you know, again, if you think about how the, the profession has evolved, bike lanes were the bee's knees 10, 20 years ago. Um, but now bike lanes and paint in of themselves perhaps aren't sufficient enough to ensure the safety of cyclists and, and kind of attract um, those all ages abilities users. So, um, yeah, the idea. So, first of all, one of the things I should say is that the transportation plan itself calls for upgrading existing bike facilities to make them high comfort, which then therefore, as you heard me describe, means making them protected. So this would, you know, one of the, the leading projects for consideration is looking at Packard. What are the improvements we can make to the bike, Packard bike facility um, to make it more comfortable to bike on, to improve the safety for cyclists, uh, and to address the safety concerns that are raised in the question. So, uh, yep, it's on the table. Again, I will say that, you know, a lot of the projects that are included in the $9.5 million Vision Zero 
program as it was envisioned would be vetted publicly through a separate engagement process if council decides to award that project. So, you know, we would make sure that we would go out to the community with kind of what we were thinking, get some additional feedback, you know, make tweaks to it that would help inform the design, so forth and so on. So, um, you know, again, I don't have a design to show you per se, because we haven't gotten any funding to, to forward that piece along. But if it were to be funded, it is something that we would, you know, solicit feedback on. Um, there is a question of um, what is the likelihood this project would be funded without using Recovery Act funds? So, you know, there are two different projects. One is the Vision Zero implementation strategy and, and action plan. Um, what we have historically done with a lot of our safety projects is um, what I call opportunistic. If there was a road reconstruction, um, Cynthia, Eli, other members of the transportation, transportation team would kind of look at the project and see if there are changes that could be made to address either safety concerns or multimodal access or, you know, anything like that, that improvements that could be made. Um, this project would kind of flip that on its script, that instead of us, you know, piggybacking off of an existing project, we would drive the, the projects based on where the need is the greatest. And so, um, I think, you know, in terms of whether projects would happen uh, under the Vision Zero program or not, yeah, they would, but they would kind of trickle in. They would be one-offs. They would be, you know, projects where we just piggyback or ride the coattails of another project. This would be much more targeted. Um, for the Miller Catherine, I will admit to you, there isn't any identified program funding for that. Um, that there is a resurfacing project on a section of Miller. Uh, and I don't have the, um, I think it's from Newport to, uh, I don't even think it goes all the way to first. I think it stops short at first. So, you know, when that resurfacing project, which the Miller Catherine project is meant to be aligned with, uh, you know, we could look at some of those safety improvements, but it wouldn't run the whole length, right? It would, it would just be kind of that piece where we would kind of piggyback off of, like I just described. So, you know, that's how we've historically done the project. Um, and, you know, with this funding that's available to us, the idea is to really kind of ingest some life and, and breathe some life into these projects to, to make sure they, they kind of get us moving towards this Vision Zero initiative that was recently adopted. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed some of it. Um, there, on my end, it, looked, it appears that there's a few questions left. Um, how would the Miller Catherine facility tie into the planned Miller Avenue road reconstruction between Linda Vista and Chapin in 2024? Yeah, and actually, that's those are the limits I meant to describe just now. So, uh, yeah, this project would be integrated with that. So, um, Nick Hutchinson is the city engineer. I report to Nick. Um, we've talked about if this project gets funded, we would align its scheduling with that project because we obviously don't want to go out and, you know, close the road or tear up the road twice or whatever. We, it would all be integrated. So um, now, like I just mentioned, that resurfacing project doesn't run the whole length. So then there would be additional work beyond just that resurfacing project. Um, but we would make sure that those are all synchronized. Okay, great. Um, and then just a comment, uh, which is please protect Packard. <laughs> and, that, and then, oh, go ahead, Raymond. Oh, there was one that I thought, um, let's see. We had switched over to answered. It was talking about a little bit more detail on the Vision Zero. Um, Okay, here it is. Uh, these projects definitely seem exciting. Could you talk a bit in more depth about some of the other elements in the Vision Zero implementation project, such as the bike network signage, bike boulevard, street lights, and how some of those were prioritized? Um, so I'm gonna start on this answer and then I will ask for uh, some assistance from Eli Cooper um, uh, as well. So. You know, when we first envisioned the project, again, we, we looked at some of the materials in the Vision Zero plan. Um, and, you know, there's some, some great maps, and actually I will share my screen again, if I may, 
just to kind of give you a flavor of it. Um, so let's see. Oops. Come on. All right, can you see the three maps on the screen? So yeah. let me just put this in presentation mode because I think it'll look a little bit better. Um, are you seeing the presentation mode or are you seeing just the same jumbled three maps? Uh, Zoom all makes not it the presentation mode, it's just the three maps still. Okay, then let me let me just drag them and show you what they look like. So um, if it's gonna let me do that. Um, so, you know, for example, this first map shows where the uh, focus intersections and corridors are. Uh, so these are the safety areas of concern, right? So the purple dots show that there's an intersection that has a crash problem, and then the orange and yellow or orange and red lines show where there are corridors that have uh, concern. Um, then there's another map of new uncontrolled crosswalks that are prioritized. And then there's a map of, you know, the bike network. Uh, and so, you know, what we try to do is we try to overlap as many of these as possible to see, you know, which project can deliver the most bang for the buck. Uh, and that's kind of our starting point in terms of how we identified uh, a lot of the projects that are contained therein. Um, the other thing, too, I should note is, you know, we do have a backlog of needs that we are always trying to catch up on. So uh, streetlights are a good one. Um, we know that there are crosswalks within our community that do not have adequate what we call positive contrast lighting. Uh, positive contrast lighting is lighting that um, provides uh, light in front of the pedestrian from the approaching vehicle's perspective. Uh, so the idea is that you don't, you know, shadow the pedestrian out. You kind of make sure that they're visible, especially at nighttime. This project actually is, includes a line item to upgrade all of our crosswalks to not only meet our crosswalk design guidelines specifications, but also provide adequate, you know, lighting as well. Um, and then there are other projects that have been talked about for a while, such as a community-wide bicycle wayfinding signage program, um, which is, you know, some of the, the things that I, I'd like to lean on Eli to help me answer. So um, maybe, Eli, let me turn it over to you, and you can kind of expound on, you know, the, the projects that we developed and, and some of the thinking that went into those and some of the history on some of those community conversations um, on those projects. Hey, thank you, Raymond, and good afternoon uh, to uh, our audience. Uh, the two um, aspects of this question that I think I can um, shed uh, some light on include uh, both the uh, Bike Boulevard as well as that community-wide signage program. Um, as uh, many might know, over the past um, period of time, a decade, decade and a half now, we have um, invested our resources in creating a uh, more comprehensive bicycle network following council's direction from the early 2000s. Uh, with the amount of resources we had available, it was a conscious decision to invest in creating a network, although we were well aware of the need to provide information about how that network could accommodate uh, individuals travel uh, from one part of the city to the other. There uh, has long been a policy in our adopted non-motorized transportation plan to provide what I call 3D uh, signage. And that doesn't mean that it jumps off the quote unquote placard at you, but it provides uh, information, including a destination, uh, an arrow providing a direction to that destination and information, whether it's in feet or miles as to a distance and that the um, practical reality is providing that level of information encourages folks who might be willing to ride a half a mile or a mile, but don't really know how far it is to get to a destination. Uh, so there's a lot of literature that supports providing this uh, comprehensive 3D signage in the community will help to increase uh, the numbers of individuals, uh, residents, guests, visitors, students, uh, to uh, use uh, active transportation, bicycling and walking uh, to access uh, a variety of destinations in the community. This is consistent both uh, with our Vision Zero uh, aspects in that uh, more people that would be relying on active uh, transportation, walking and bicycling as opposed to motorized traffic. 
reduces the safety uh, um, that might be uh, safety threats that might uh, be presented by someone driving. And similarly, our Vision Zero plan uh, complements the city's sustainability strategy. And the more uh, trips that are taken by human powered modes uh, reduces the greenhouse gases that would be generated. And so uh, in a broad sense, uh, pro providing more information to our community will help us achieve those multiple goals. With respect to the second area that I could touch upon, the bike boulevards, uh, this is a strategy that um, came to us back in the uh, initial transportation plan, uh, non-motorized transportation plan of 2007. Uh, the recognition was that there are some streets. Uh, Euron uh, becomes a perfect example where it is of a certain width, where we don't have the capacity to put a bicycle lane on street, and that the volume and the speed of traffic is very hostile for bicyclists but there may be a neighborhood street immediately parallel. And so when you think about Washington from Ravenna into the downtown area, it literally is one block south of the jackson Huron corridor and provides a neighborhood street connection. Uh, the bicycle boulevard strategy is one that uh, the way it's framed in our planning process is not merely to put up a sign that says, this is a better way to bicycle from here to there, but that we would also look at uh, installing uh, certain types of traffic calming devices in order to uh, discourage higher speeds and through traffic on what we would call a bicycle boulevard, at the same time mm -hmm. enabling bicyclists to flow smoothly uh, along the boulevard to get to the destination. In this instance, whether it's uh, into the downtown or out to uh, the west side neighborhoods. Uh, the other bike boulevard, just quickly, that was uh, framed uh, a decade or so ago uh, is the Elmwood Corridor, and that's uh, immediately adjacent to uh, Platte Road. And we have, um, it's a shorter segment than Washington, uh, but again, because of the width of the right-of-way, the high volume of traffic on Platte, not as much the speed, but uh, there mm -hmm. is um, a high volume out there that in looking at uh, where we are today with uh, Platte coming off of Washtenaw and having bike lanes on that is a signalized crossing there uh, into the city park uh, that an Elmwood bike boulevard can connect from Packard all the way up to that traffic signal in a much uh, calmer traffic environment. Uh, and that again, the similar treatments as to how to discourage uh, higher speed uh, driving, cut through traffic, uh, of vehicles and encourage more um, human powered active transportation on that corridor would be the goal of a process that uh, this program would fund. Um, that's uh, what I have on those two issues and I'll turn it back to Heather. Thanks. Thank you, Eli. We do have another question that came in and this question is, the data from South Main Lane configuration is significant on the order of six to 10 times speeding reduction while maintaining car throughout. Does this influence the priority of the potential for other projects around the city? Yeah, thank you uh, for that question. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware and what the, the uh, person is referring to is, we just recently shared a memo with city council uh, at their, you can find that memo in the January 3rd city council packet that talks about the reconfiguration on South Main between Packard and Stadium. Uh, you may recall Main Street used to be two vehicle lanes in each direction. Um, then uh, over this fall, we reconfigured it to be one vehicle lane in each direction with a center turn lane and then bike lanes on um, the curb side. Um, and so that pilot ran through November, but based on data collection that we observed, um, we saw a significant reduction in speeds along South Main Street, which is one of the intended outcomes of that project. Uh, and so we are continuing the pilot into 2022 for further observation to see if those kind of beneficial results uh, are sustained. Uh, and then there will be a determination made this year if, as to whether or not that configuration will be made permanent or whether it will be restored back to what it was previously. Um, so the question is, you know, are we considering this in other locations? Generally speaking, the idea is yes. I mean, um, 
This is sometimes referred to as a road diet, where you know if you have extra lanes, it often leads to car speeding. Um, so it is something that we look at pretty seriously. Now I will say, um, you know, the number of streets or roads within the the city of Ann Arbor that are four lanes or more are fairly little. I mean, there aren't a lot of them, right? And even the ones, some of the most prominent ones that run through our community are not actually city owned and maintained roadways. Um, so if you're not familiar, um, you know, Washtenaw, Huron, Jackson is a state facility that's owned and operated by MDOT. So the ones that remain are, you know, South Main, Plymouth, Earhart, you know, some others around town, but uh, our ability to do road reconfigurations, you know, is, is somewhat limited. But it is something we look at pretty closely and, and pretty seriously because we want to make sure that, you know, we're achieving these safety outcomes. Um, and, you know, sometimes a road reconfiguration is the right approach. And in other instances, uh, there might be other things that we look at. So when we try to approach uh, these safety benefits, we want to, you know, go in with an open mind in terms of, you know, what are the crash patterns? What are the things that are causing uh, those crashes? And what is the best countermeasure to you know, bring those crashes down. Uh, and if road diets or road reconfigurations is, is what the data is pointing us to, then we will look at that seriously. We'll solicit public input on it uh, before determinations are made. So you know, it is an iterative process. It is a data-driven process. It is one that is influenced also by uh, public comment that we receive. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's, it's really a case-by-case -case and corridor-by-corridor -corridor, uh, process and decision that we have to make. All right, thank you, Raymond. I'm not seeing any other uh, written questions. Oh, we do have a hand raise. All right, Larry, uh, you should be able to talk now. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, uh, just a couple comments on uh, cycle tracks, two, two way versus one way. The, the downtown ones seem to work reasonably well as two way because there's low speeds. Uh, but I, I have a question. I question whether that would be appropriate on the higher speed corridors with a lot of intersections and driveways like Miller or Packard. So I, my, my inclination would be to go with uh, one-way protected uh, facilities on each side as opposed to two-way. And I think Packard, as an earlier person mentioned, would be a priority on that uh, as well as potentially Miller. Um, I think that a lot of the projects that are listed as possibilities in your materials regarding Vision Zero look like, look real good. And one, that I would call attention to there is the, the whole issue uh, down the hill from the hospital in the Fuller Maiden Lane area where there's, uh, for over 30 years, there's been plans to improve the facilities there for biking and walking and not much has been done. And the, 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 the thousands of walkers and bikers there every day and potentially more if we had better facilities. So I think that is a priority area for improvements uh, to, to be done. And, uh, so there's a couple of my comments. I appreciate what you're doing on all this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Larry, for the comment. Um, just, you know, a little bit of follow up on that. Um, you know, I might even ask Eli and Cynthia to chime in as well. I, I know for some of that border to border connection stuff around Fuller, um, you know, that was something that I think, you know, Eli was thinking through. And, you know, some of these that needs have been identified for years, as, as Mr. Deck just mentioned. Um, and there just hasn't been kind of an opportunity to really kind of, um, you know, get those projects off the ground because there wasn't a, a complementary or adjacent project nearby that we could piggyback off of. So this, again, this funding source would really allow us to elevate those and make them their own project in and of themselves. Um, and then, yeah, to your point about the cycle track on Miller, you know, you, you've also brought up, you know, we heard earlier uh, in our call about some of the maintenance concerns. Um, and that should be factored in, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, whether the cycle track option is the best option the whole way along the corridor, uh, I don't have a definitive answer for you. I mean, I think each have their pros and cons. And so we would want to pursue a facility that kind of achieves, you know, the, the best outcomes, both in terms of safety, but, and in terms of kind of, um, providing that high comfort facility to, uh, the users of it. But you bring up very good points that, you know, with, you know, conflicts with higher speeds, uh, we need to look very carefully about what sort of design we are going to pursue. Um, and Larry, I see your hand up again, but let me see if Eli or Cynthia want to um, supplement anything I just said about some of those border to border trail connections or any of the other safety programs that are part of the bigger Vision Zero project. 
Uh, thank you for the question, Larry, and thank you for the opportunity just to pile on, Raymond. Um, uh, the um, issue about the connection at the Fuller East Medical uh, Bridge area is an important one that I wanted to touch on that uh, that had been identified back in the 2007 city non-motorized transportation plan. And uh, there has been an ongoing design effort for uh, addressing the traffic um, knot that exists at the Fuller uh, East Medical um, Maiden Lane intersection. And so although we have uh, outlined uh, the need for uh, this uh, shared use path connection, the fact is that it was saddled together with the intractable intersection design process. And so uh, opportunity knocks, uh, funding becomes available. And rather than waiting for a larger project to be funded, we've been able to pull this specific set of uh, long-standing requested and needed improvements and move them forward uh, outside of the uh, intersection project and process itself. Uh, if we receive uh, the uh, community support in order to advance this project, I look forward to seeing the installation of uh, these improvements. Um, and, and hopefully that might propel us forward with the intersection as well. But uh, Larry, uh, appreciate your tenacity uh, and uh, stick to itiveness on this. And this is one opportunity that we see to potentially uh, advance some active transportation shared use path elements that have been long sought at, but not funded because they have been linked with other projects. Thank you. Larry, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, am I still? Uh, yeah, you're still. still right. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, appreciate your uh, your comments on that. And uh, and perhaps as you're suggesting, this could be an impetus to resolve whatever problems there are at that intersection in terms of vehicle traffic and get, get the whole package taken care of. Regarding the uh, the uh, cycle tracks, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what, whether to go one way or two way, but I think that the one way has a lot of uh, uh, advantages potentially, but that would raise the issue, as you said, of maintenance. And it'd be good in looking at this to look at the whole issue of how uh, maintenance can be figured into that and, and make sure there's provision for that, uh, make sure it's planned with that in mind. Thanks. Thank you. And then we do have another, um, oh, it's a comment that says, excited for the potential of Miller Catherine uh, facility. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Heather, this might be a good time to talk to the, um, you know, the community feedback if a product yes. is awarded. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, I did want to make sure that we address that before we ended today. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my slide deck anymore. I had to switch computers all together to get back on. I'll just add that to the comedy of errors um, in the Zoom life world that we're in right now. Um, so I don't have my graphic with me, but just very generally, um, the process is uh, right now we're doing, this is what we're considering kind of the educational um, phase of the process. So we're um, wanting just to get the word out so people understand the ARPA funds, what they're about, and some of the projects that are being proposed. We are also entertaining um, suggestions from people. Again, the, the, um, the criteria for what meets um, ARPA funding eligibility is really kind of finicky, you know. Um, so we don't have a, like a particular form for people to fill out, but you are welcome to send emails. Um, and you can send me an email, my email is hcypherth, um, hopefully you can see my name right there at a2gov.org, or you can go to the project site and look up our emails and you can send either Kayla or myself an email, but now is the time to do that. So if you have some other projects that you would like to suggest, you are welcome to do that. Um, that will get fed back to the project team. Um, there'll be another round of kind of assessing what meets the um, project criteria. And then we'll be releasing a survey. So we hope to get this out far and wide. So stay tuned for that. But the survey will be an exercise in 
trying to gauge what the preferences are of people. So it'll be uh, a funding allocation exercise basically through the survey. So where would you put the money? Where would you want this spent? When, what projects would you want it spent on? And all of that will be compiled and then fed to um, city council and city council will ultimately be making the decisions about where the allocation will go. Uh, so that will happen in March, that decision-making. Uh, so um, please stay tuned. We do have um, more, more meetings coming up. We have another one uh, that are two more today, and then we have uh, several more next week. So please, if you're interested in doing a deeper dive like this into the other projects, please um, attend the other meetings. Um, and I think that covers it. Um, anything yeah, else that the project team would like to add? Yes. Yeah, if I may just supplement something. So what Heather described is the process getting up to the council decision about where the funding will be allocated. Um, I, I will say, you know, some of the projects will also include, if awarded, would include additional input and feedback. So yes. I want to be clear about that, that really, you know, we're looking at these buckets, we're looking at these projects at kind of high level to see, you know, what there's community support for, what council would like to support. And then once a decision is made, then we'll start digging into a lot of the details. Um, I will say, you know, some of the projects probably lend themselves to a little bit more public engagement than others. Uh, so, for example, you know, the projects I've described today will probably be fairly heavy on public engagement because that's just the process of being iterative and identifying how these projects are going to work and achieve the things we want them to achieve. Um, other projects, if they get awarded, may be, you know, not as, uh, you know, input heavy. So when I think of the fire station, right, you know, fire station is a fire station and the location is already selected. So it's just a question of, you know, what that is and what the needs are and, and not to say there won't be any public engagement on it but i just want to kind of temper expectations about which projects might lend themselves to additional input after and if funding is received mm -hmm. yeah thank you raymond for that yeah um in some ways this is really just the beginning of many of these projects all right any other um we do have a few minutes left so any if anybody has any uh questions or comments please feel free to ask them now or state them now Otherwise, we thank you for your time. We really appreciate you attending these. We had really good attendance today. Um, yeah, thank you again for taking the time to learn more about these projects. Okay, yeah, I think that's it. Well, well, project team, if you don't mind just staying on the line for a little bit more, just in case anybody comes in with a question, but otherwise, again, thank you everyone. Yeah, and just to fill the dead air, I do want to thank everyone as well. Um, and I also want to put in a plug to, you know, vote for us uh, for the Miller Catherine project and the Vision Zero project because they're the best. Um, you know, Heather, you might want to just speak to a little bit about the um, online uh, survey since we have a little talk about when that will launch and what that will look like and how people can tie into that. Um, yeah, that'll be uh, released towards the end of the month or beginning of February. Um, so we, you know, we'll again do another assessment of the projects and then put that out there through this uh, online survey. And we do want to get that, get the word out about that. So we're hoping that you'll help us do that because we do want to get as many voices and um, providing their opinions about that. Um, so that will be released and that will go for several weeks and that will be um, compiled all of that information will be compiled and so we'll tabulate you know where people's preferences are and and let city council know about that great and then correct me if i'm wrong if people want to receive regular updates there's like a gov delivery function um for this and, as well yeah thank you raymond i appreciate that um yeah so that's on the website um that's on the project website so if you do want to get email updates about that there is a, a thing where you can put in your email we'll also be looking at um people who signed up for these meetings too and we'll we'll, we'll be sure to add your email in there And Raymond, I guess, well, we have a few minutes left or any one of you, um, since I switched computers, I don't have access to the 
um, materials, but if you happen to have the slide deck or if you could bring up the project website and share that, that would be excellent. Yeah, Heather, I'm pulling up the website now. I actually, I, the, the deck that you shared doesn't have those before and after slides. It's just the project slides. So I don't, I was going to bring up the deck for you, but I, I didn't have access to it. But I oh, will okay. show the screen um, so that folks can see um, how they can. All right, so now on screen. Is it showing the right thing? The American it is. Rescue Plan? Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, so you'll see over to the right of the screen, there's a button to subscribe where you can put in your email. Um, and then you can email myself right there. And then Kayla Coleman, who was the other community engagement specialist that came in while I <laughs> got knocked off of Zoom. And the other thing to note, if you haven't seen the videos, there are links to those as well um, down here at the bottom. Um, so you can, again, you know, look at the two best ones, which are the Vision Zero implementation and Catherine, um, and then all the runner-ups are there as well. Thank you, and we received a thank you through the Q and A. Always appreciated. Heather, you want to keep the website up just so people have that? Yeah, I think that's probably the best thing to show right now. Will do. That way it'll give people a chance to write these things down or even find pen and paper to write something down. I know I hardly have any on hand anymore. <laughs> And then there is a short URL for this too, right? It's a2gov.org slash rescue funds. Yeah, you can see it a little bit in this um, uh, postcard that's down here, that, that graphic that's right there. Oh, yeah. I don't see any other questions coming in or comments. I suppose we could go out if you wanted to show one of the videos, Raymond. I'll give it a shot. Let me see if sometimes uh, audio works peculiar. Um, yeah. But we'll, we'll see. if it if you can't hear the audio on it, let me know, and then I'll I'll stop it. Project name, 
Miller Catherine Bike Facility. What is the project? The Miller Catherine Bike Facility would be a high comfort, low stress bicycle facility along Miller Avenue and Catherine Street from West City Limits to the University of Michigan. As a part of this project, traffic calming measures would also be included to address safety concerns regarding speeding vehicles and pedestrian crossings. Why do the project? This project would help implement the recently adopted Moving Together Towards Vision Zero Transportation Master Plan, which identifies Miller Catherine as a corridor that is desired to have an all ages and abilities bicycle facility. An all ages and abilities bicycle facility means a bicycle facility that is comfortable to use by any type of cyclist. Protected bike lanes, like the ones on Williams and First Street, would be an example of this. What would the project involve? If awarded, the project would include public engagement to help influence the design for a calmed street with inclusion of an all ages and abilities bike facility. How do the American Rescue Plan funds help? Without the American Rescue Plan funds, this project would be delayed until other opportunities are available, such as when funds and timing are identified for the road to be resurfaced. All right, that brings us right to 1.30. Yes, thank you again, everybody. And we hope to see you at future meetings. And thank you, thank Project. Thank you, everybody. Remember, vote Miller, Catherine, and Vision Zero. <laughs> <laughs>